Good morning. Busy morning. Well, we have been on a summer series on the Gospel of Mark, and we are at the second last Sunday of this series over the last three months. I pray you've enjoyed it and have at least read the Gospel of Mark once. Still got one more week to go, all right? Last chance. Well, over this series, we've covered Jesus, the long-awaited King, Jesus, the King who brings healing, how's our heart, uh, Jesus is the king who provides. Jesus is the king who must die. What's your choice? Jesus is the humble king. Jesus is the king who brings judgment. Jesus is the king who will return. And last week, Pastor Loretta shared with us and asked us, are you Judas? And so for this second last uh, Sunday on the Gospel of Mark, we've invited a very special guest who is no stranger to our church. Uh, Dr. Ho Bun Tiong is currently serving as the LCC chairperson at Badok Methodist Church where he has been worshipping for the last 44 years. He is married to Diana and they have three adult children and one 10-month-old granddaughter. He has recently published a book, A Better You, on personal development for those who want to make their lives count. And this book will be available after the service at the foyer at $20. And every copy of the book uh, sold, $1 goes to charity. And there are only 10 copies, so fastest one there gets them. Put, please put your hands together as we welcome Dr. Ho this morning. Good morning, dearly beloved. Morning. I want to thank your pastor, uh, Reverend Jeremy Ong, for the invitation to share this morning's God's Word with you. I bring you greetings from Bedok Methodist Church and from my family. Uh, unfortunately, my wife and my children can't be here because they are serving with the youth ministry. Well, I want to start by saying I love to preach. Okay, but I must qualify. I love to preach to myself. Because every time I prepare a sermon, God speaks to me and God is changing me. So I, I like that intimacy with God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, nourish us by the transforming power of your word so that we may flourish as disciples of Jesus Christ. Speak, O Lord, right now, for we, your people, are eagerly waiting to hear from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we are on to Mark chapter 14, uh, verse 26, all the way to Mark 15, verse 15. And there are just four key aspects I want to share with us. First, the context of the Gospel of Mark, and then the collapse of Peter's courage, and then the communion in the garden, and the confrontation towards Jesus. The context of the Gospel of Mark. What is a Gospel? A Gospel really is a very different kind of literature. It has a very special genre. It is not a biography, neither is it a history. It is actually an earth-shattering news bulletin to be read aloud. It's kind of like good news to be announced. So the Gospel of Mark, and some scholars would rather call it the Gospel of Peter according to Mark, because Mark was actually the number two person. He was like the personal assistant uh, to first his older cousin uh, Barnabas, and then to the Apostle Paul, and then to Luke. Mark actually met Luke in Rome later on. And last but not least, to Peter. And uh, Mark actually was Peter's uh, interpreter in some instances. And we know he has a name called John Mark because John, Johanna, is a Hebrew name, but Mark, Marcus, is actually his Latin name. And it's very interesting that Mark, the author of this gospel, doesn't really name himself, although he dropped hints here and there to say that he is the one who wrote it. Uh, probably because he wants to give the full attention to the key person in the gospel, which of course is Jesus Christ himself. A little bit more about the gospel of Mark. Uh, the gospel of Mark is actually the earliest recorded gospel. 
right, between AD 57 to 59. And, uh, you know, if you have a very famous and important person who has died, and uh, interest in this person will develop in different stages. I mean, recently we just had, you know, a commemorated 100th uh, years of uh, LKY's birth. And if you have someone who passed away, uh, interest in that famous or important person will develop in various stages. Uh, most people begin by wanting to know what did this person do? What did Jesus do? And so Mark, being the earliest gospel, recorded what Jesus did. If you look at the Gospel of Mark, there are many accounts of miracles. In fact, there are 18 miracles, but just four parables. And as interest develops, you will find that it moves on to a second stage. More than what this important person did, many will want to know what did this person say? What did Jesus say? And you find that in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. Of course, in the Gospel of Matthew, it was written by Matthew, a Jew, for the Jews about the king of the Jews. All right? And Luke also. So you find that what Jesus said was recorded in those two Gospels. And then when you come finally to the last stage of wanting to know an important person, it's more than what he did, what he said, but who really is this important person? Who really is Jesus Christ? And you find that in the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, you find that there are many of these seven I am. Jesus said, I am. I'm the bread of life, you know. Uh, so it's very interesting that the Gospel, uh, you know, kind of like highlight these different stages uh, of wanting to know about a very important person, in this case, Jesus, King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. So in the Gospel of Mark itself, you find that for two and a half years, uh, so it's kind of interesting, this is the second last sermon on the Gospel of Mark, and I kind of give you uh, a, an overview again, you know, a summary overview. For two and a half years from Jordan to Mount Hermon, it's recorded in Mark chapter 1 to chapter 9. And it's, it's very quick pace, you know. And then it comes finally to the one week, and then fi finally to the one day, and then finally to the remaining last few hours before the crucifixion. And so today we come to Mark 14, it's really about Jesus' last Passover. So let's look at Mark 14, reading from verse 26 to 28. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Actually, this is recorded in Zechariah chapter 17, verse 3. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now Peter said to Jesus, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. Uh, this is Peter, you know, if you really know Peter, this is Peter himself. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, that this very night, this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you. And imagine Peter in front of all the other disciples. He, he was, you know, so sure of himself. He said, even if all the other disciples will deny you, I will not, you know. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. Now we begin to see in a couple of other verses later on, the collapse of Peter's courage. Peter appeared courageously confident. Uh, and here we have this impetuous Peter. You know, but we're going to see very soon that what happens to Peter. After all, this impetuous Peter was the one who walked on the water. None of the other disciples did, but he was the one who took the first step and walked on the water. He was the one, the action man, the one who probably act before he thinks. Right? And so in Mark chapter 14, verse verses 43 to 44, we read, Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and club. Now, it's very interesting in the Gospel of Mark, as we read this Gospel, and I would uh, encourage you just like uh, Pastor did, please read the Gospel of Mark. If you can at one sitting, read it out aloud, you know, the whole Gospel. 
It's like a news bulletin meant to be announced. Read it out aloud. And we, as you do that, you find that the Gospel of Mark, as we read it, we are carried along with this breathless excitement. You know, you find this word immediately, straight away, immediately. You find it recorded 41 times. So immediately, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he was betraying now, he who was betraying him had given them a special signal, a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under God. So, in Mark, because it's the first earliest recorded gospel of Jesus, it's about what Jesus did. There were no long sermons, there were no sermon on the mount. You don't find that in Mark. It's full of action immediately. And so, here you have Judas coming up. And in verse 45, it says, After coming, Judas immediately, immediately again, immediately went to Jesus saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. That was a signal. You know, what an irony. A symbol of affection turned into a sign of betrayal. A kiss is actually a, a symbol of affection. But that was a signal to seize Jesus. And they laid hand on him and seized him. And so what did Peter do? Now Peter is this impetuous Peter. What did he do? In Mark 14, 47, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and, and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now in the record of Mark, we don't know who this person is. You know, Mark is very interesting. He doesn't name himself. He doesn't even name some of this, but he dropped hints here and there. But in, if you turn to John chapter 18, verse 10, we read, Simon Peter... Then, having a sword, so it was Peter himself having a sword, drew it and struck off the high priest's slaves and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So we even know the slave's name from the Gospel of John. right? So that was what Peter did. This impetuous Peter drew out his sword and cut off the high priest's slave's right ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come up with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the Scriptures. It's very important. All this that happened was to fulfill the Scriptures, just as what God had intended. And they all left Him and fled. So at a critical moment, all disciples left Jesus and fled. And then we read in 53 to 54, they led Jesus away to the high priests and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. So Jesus was brought to the high priest. And in 54, Peter had followed him at a distance. So here was Peter again. He was the one who was full of action. You know, all of them fled, including Peter. But then Peter turned and followed him at a distance. And he went right into the courtyard of the high priest and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. So the impetuous Peter, well, while Peter did not uh, miss uh, Marcus entirely, he did miss the whole point entirely, right? He was this courageously confident Peter, so sure of himself, but actually he felt miserably. Right, this book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, actually concentrated on Peter's weaknesses. You know, so Peter failed. How do we know? You look at Mark 14, verse 66 to 68, and Peter was below in the courtyard, and one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the Nazarene. But he denied it. Peter denied it, saying, I knew neither, I, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the porch. So here was Peter's first denial. And then you go on to 69 to 71. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, This is one of them. But again, he denied it two times. And after a while, while the bystanders were again saying to Peter, Surely, you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse 
and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. Three times. And then comes Mark 14, 72, and you see this word again, immediately a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before a rooster crows thrice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. Peter's denial of Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. That's a fact. And it's shown through his speech and through his face. His speech and his face gave him away. He says, no, no, I'm not. I don't even know him. What are you talking about? But let's be fair to Peter. At least he got as far as the courtyard, which the others didn't. All right? The others fled, but at least Peter followed at a distance. And at least Peter wept. Peter was remorseful. It broke his heart for what he had done. Judas couldn't have wept except for himself. And I know last week, uh, Pastor Loretta uh, preached on it and uh, you had the conversations and there was a question about uh, Judas and about Peter comparing Judas with Peter. I actually did some homework, okay? I went to your church website, listened to all previous sermons, look at all the, the Mentimeter questions, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so be merciful to me, okay? During conversations. I actually told uh, uh, Pastor Jeremy I have an escape clause. If I can't answer, PIC is there. <laughs> but Peter, you know, the impetuous Peter, who was so courageously confident, did deny Jesus three times. Three times. And so the Gospel of Mark recorded for us the weaknesses of Peter. Peter felt miserably. Right? And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Talking about Jesus. And of course, as Jesus was stating the matter plainly, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. All right? But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but men's. Again, this is recorded for us in Mark chapter 8. So the Gospel of Mark records for us Peter's weaknesses, how he has felt miserably. Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. But Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on men's. It was God's will for Jesus to be seized and to be killed. Have we failed our Lord? Last week, Pastor Loretta asked, Are we Judas? This week, I could have asked the same question. Are you Peter? Have we failed our Lord? At the most critical moment where we are supposed to identify ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ, do we, like Peter, fled, run away, and deny the Lord three times? I'm sure in our Christian life, there are moments of failures, there are moments of disappointments, moments of not living up to be Christ's disciples. But I want to encourage us this morning from Psalm 63 verse 3, God says, His loving kindness is better than life, and my lips will praise you. So while the Gospel of Mark recorded Peter's weaknesses and failures, in the other Gospel, you find that Peter was reinstated. Peter was restored. You find this in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He was asking his disciples, who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Caesarea Philippi is a very interesting place. If you do a little bit more research and read about it, it's at the foot of Mount Hermon. You know, and this is a place where you have the beginning of River Jordan. And uh, at the center of it, it is in this cliff, there is a cave. And on this cave, you find that there are two statues. One is of the Greek god Pan, all right, and the other is of a statue of Caesar, the Roman king. 
It's very interesting that you have these two statues because the Greek god Pan was actually God appearing as mortal man. And the Roman king Caesar was actually Caesar king, mortal man wanting to be God. And so right at this place, Jesus came into this place and asked his disciples, who do you say that the Son of Man is? It's very interesting, isn't it? And actually, you know at that moment, Matthew 16, continuing 15 to 18, uh, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So now Jesus turned to the disciples and asked, who do you say that I am? Again, Simon Peter. He was the first to answer. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon but Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. It's very interesting that at up to that point, when the disciples could recognize Jesus as the Son of God, you know, the Son of the living God, that Jesus says, I will build my church. Upon you, Peter, the rock, I will build my church. Jesus cannot build his church until people know who he is because the church is built up of people who knew who Jesus is. Here's a little Bible trivia. Do you know who is the first woman who declared the same thing? Jesus, you are the son of the living God. You are the Christ. Do you know? It's actually found in John chapter 11, verse 27. If you look at John chapter 11, verse 27, Martha, Martha was the first woman to say of Jesus, you are the Christ. You know, remember the story of Mary and Martha? Martha said to Jesus, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ the Son of God, even He who comes into the world. And so Peter was restored, right? In Mark, you, you read about how Peter failed Jesus miserably, but Peter was restored. And then in John chapter 21, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. And again, you continue in verse 16 and 17. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love him. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love him. And Jesus said to him, can my sheep. And so just as... G just as Peter denied Jesus three times, Peter was restored. You know, Peter was restored by Jesus asking him, do you love me? And Peter had to confess, yes, Lord, I love you. And if you go on to read later on, you know, the epistles of First Peter and Second Peter, you will get a better understanding of why Peter was like that. So I encourage all of us this morning, press on. Even if we have filled Jesus in whatever ways, Press on, because God is not done with us yet. God is not done with us yet. I notice that your church vision is nourished to flourish, but your theme for 2023 is press on, pressing on, press on. God is not done with us yet. So let's come back to Mark chapter 14, and there is a passage from 32 to 42 about Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. So here we are now looking at the communion in the Garden. Right? So let's look at Mark chapter 14, verse 32. They came to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John. So these were the three uh, inner group. All right? And began to be very distressed and troubled. Here was Jesus, very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Jesus instructed his disciples to remain and keep watch. And then he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray as if, pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. You see how the Gospel of Mark you know, contains 
uh, the, the excitement from the first nine chapters to ten, from the beginning part, two and a half years to, to six months, and now to the final hour. Right? If it were possible, let this hour pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, and this is a very important word, yet, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus struggled even as he comes to this final hour. And he cried out to God, Abba, Father, Daddy, would you please remove this cup from me? But then he added, Yet, not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. He found the disciples sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? And I read of a story of how a preacher preached this same sermon. And when he came to this point, he paused. Because he was the pastor of the church, he could pause for one hour. <laughs> and the congregation were just left dumbfounded. What is pastor doing? And at the end of it, he asked his congregation members, what came to your mind when I paused for that one hour? And one of them said, keep watch and pray. That's what God wants us to do. Keep watch and pray. Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We all know that too well. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then he went again and prayed, saying the same words. Jesus was deeply grieved. He was troubled. And again, he came and found the disciples sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time. If God had to tell us three times, that's an important message. And said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is, going, is being betrayed into the hands of sinner. Get up, let us be going. And behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Like Peter, Jesus pressed on. But unlike Peter who failed the Lord miserably, Jesus succeeded because he kept watch and pray. He says, yet not what I will. He prayed, Lord, remove this cup from me. I, I can't remove this. But he says, yet not what I will, but Lord, what you will. He succeeded because he relied on God the Father for strength. The spirit is willing. As the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Keep watch and pray. What I learned from this is commune with God always. Commune with God always. Now, when you read these few verses, I don't know about you, but when I read it, I was kind of like curious. The disciples were fast asleep, right? And yet, it was recorded for us what Jesus prayed. How did the disciples... Oh, some, some of you are nodding your head. You probably have that question in your mind which you're going to ask in Mentimeter later on, right? How did, how, did the, how did the disciples know? How was it recorded? They were all sleeping. <laughs> but Jesus was praying. <laughs> well, there's a little hint, a little clue. If you read this part, there's a young man who flees naked. There's a young man who fled naked. You found that in Mark chapter 14, verse 51 to 52. A young man was following him, following Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen sheet, you know, a kind of a bed sheet over his naked body. And they seized him, but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. Who is this young man? I believe this young man is none other than the author of the Gospel of Mark, John Mark himself. You know, they had the Last Supper in his house and he's probably one of those young men who heard what the Jesus and the disciples were talking about. And so he grabbed a bed sheet and he followed Jesus and he was probably hiding behind the olive tree, you know. And here Jesus was telling the disciples, no, keep watch and pray and Jesus went. So he overheard everything. And so he dropped a hint that this is probably Mark himself, the author of this gospel. 
Otherwise, how would we have this account of what Jesus prayed? Interesting, isn't it? The last point, confrontation towards Jesus, or rather the court trials of Jesus. Now, let's read Mark chapter 14, verse 43 again. Immediately, you find this immediately, right? He, while he was still speaking, Judas came up and then accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs and then were, who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And then Judas betrayed him with the keys and they seized him. All right, and then they laid hands on him and seized him. And now we go on to Mark chapter 15. Early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately, again you have this word, held a consultation. And binding Jesus, led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Pilate questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, it is as you say. Now, if you read Mark 14 and Mark 15, do you know that there are two trials? One was the Jewish trial by the chief priests and the scribes, and the other was actually, before Pontius Pilate, a Roman trial. Do you know that there's a big difference because when they seized Jesus and brought him to the chief priest, the charge that they brought against Jesus was, are you the Christ, the Messiah? That was according to the Jewish trial, right? But do you know that when they brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate now asked him, are you the king of the Jews? They have changed the charge against Jesus because the Romans are not too interested about the Christ and the Messiah but they'll be very concerned if someone claimed to be king. Are you the king of the Jews? But in any case, both trials were rigged. All right? They bring false accusations against Jesus and all that. So Pontius Pilate questioned Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, it is as you say, as if to say that you, being the you know, uh, king, you should know that if you are the judge of the Romans' trial, you should consider the evidence, right? You should find the evidence. And so the chief priests begin to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. He was really amazed. But both trials were rigged. Do you know that Jesus was arrested before even a charge was made against him. He wasn't charged, but he was just simply arrested because Judas betrayed him. And do you know that the arrest was organised by his judges who became accomplices in the case? They were the ones who arrested him and they are the ones who were the judges of the case. And so it's, it's, it's just flawed. The whole trial is just flawed. And then, finally, you read, as is the custom uh, or Pilate in those days to release a criminal, right? In Mark chapter 15, verse 14, but Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? At least Pontius Pilate tried many times to evade the trial. He demanded that the case be reopened and retrialed. He did examine Jesus, the prisoner, the criminal, so-called criminal himself, by asking him directly, are you the king of the Jews? Right? He did give Jesus a chance to defend. So at least he tried many ways. But actually he tried. Do you know why he tried so many ways to, to evade the trial, to judge the trial? It's not that he wanted to release Jesus. Actually, Pontius Pilate was in the predicament. He was in the dilemma. Do you know that he, when he was governing there, there were riots among the Jews, so he, he tried not to have any more riots. Otherwise, you know, his career would be at stake. But do you know also that when he was judging the trial, his wife came in. You read this in Matthew chapter 27. His wife came in and his wife told the hubby Pilate, I have a dream. You better not have anything to do with Jesus. You know? And so he was, he was concerned. Right? And so he just tried his very best and he says, why? What evil has he done? And you know, finally, he washed his hands out of it. He says, I have nothing to do with it. All right? But they shouted all the more, crucify him, wishing to satisfy the crowd because he couldn't afford another riot. Right? Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. And it's so interesting. They demanded that Barabbas be released. 
And you know this person with this name Barabbas is Barabbas. It's actually Jesus, son of the father. But this, this guy is a bad guy because you read in Mark 15 verse 7, he's actually one of the insurrectionists. He's actually one of the political resistant leaders. He was one who created havoc, but they wanted him to be released. And so Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. Jesus had to die. Jesus must be killed. But that's God's plan. And as you read Mark 14 and 15, the interesting bit about it was this. Jesus was not on trial that day. In fact, Jesus stands as the real judge through it all. Who were the one on trial? Peter, who denied Jesus three times the chief priests and the scribes who should have known better, who should have recognised Jesus as the Messiah, wanted to crucify Him. Pontius Pilate, who should have conducted a fair trial, didn't do that. They were all failures. They all had sins. Jesus was not on trial that day. He stands as the real judge through it all. And if anyone suffered for the sins of others on that day. And even after that, it must be Jesus. It has to be Jesus. Jesus died precisely for all their failures. He took their sins upon Himself. Jesus died for us. And because Jesus died for us, the perfect sacrifice that gives us hope to press on in the midst of adversity, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of suffering. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your loving kindness never fails as you promised in Psalm 63. So Lord, it is our prayer that even as we read of the account according to the Gospel of Mark, how we have seen the failure of men, we thank you, Lord, that you are the loving, perfect judge who actually paid the price, the penalty of our sin for us so that we might live. You died that we might live. So, Lord, I pray that you will help us know you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly. For I pray and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Please uh, join me here in the hot seat that you have seen. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, bringing to us God's Word today. Uh, and uh, you, you are the first one uh, that we've invited with a PhD. <laughs> I, I told Pastor Jeremy I have a PhD but not in theology It doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> But thank you Thank you for bringing uh, God's word to us uh, Through Mark 14 and 15 Thank you for the invitation And um, I had one question yes. uh, we, we started by speaking about uh, Mark being the gospel Of Peter, right? Yep. Peter, uh, Mark wrote the gospel uh, yep. Sort of representing Peter's voice in this why did Mark then include so many failures of Peter in the gospel? Well, I think it is a gospel that speaks to us. As we read the gospel, I could almost identify myself with Peter. I'm sure we have all failures. I mean, we are human beings. We are not perfect. But at the same time, it shows who the person of Jesus Christ is. Mm. And that's, that's a beautiful contrast. You know, Another perspective you could do is, as you study the Gospel of Mark, look at the contrast. Look at the contrast. Look at the woman who came in with the, that uh, the perfume yeah. that not, and broke it for Jesus' sake. And then immediately, <laughs> immediately again, you look at Judas, right, who betrayed Jesus for a certain amount of money. One who gave everything for the Lord 
the other who try to squeeze everything out of the Lord. Mm. And that's such a beautiful contrast between mm. failure and success. Wow. Yeah, but I think, as you said it, I think the, the, the stories are recorded. I mean, the Bible is real. Yeah. It, it's not just, you know, some people say the Bible talks about God's ideal. No, that's, that's wrong. It's not, not God's ideal. Even yeah. if you look at the Sermon of the Mount, it's not God's ideal. It's actually God's standards. An ideal mm. gives us the impression that it's not something we can reach to. Right. You know? right. we, we can't strive towards it. No, it's not. We can in mm. Christ. Right. We can. So, so that's Thank my... Thank you. That's, yeah. that's, that's really good. Thank you guys for sending in your questions as well. And the QR code is on the screen. So our first question has come in. Uh, was there a need to kiss Jesus to signal... Uh, who's, who, who they were after. Wasn't he well known already for all his miracles and teachings? Yes. Yeah. That, that's an interesting one, right? Yeah. But I think the <laughs> kiss, as I've said, really brings out the contrast again. A kiss is something that shows affection, but here is a kiss of betrayal. Yes. You know? So it, it could have been any other thing. Sure. You know? But that, as God intended it, you know. Um, Again, if you read the Gospel of Mark, uh, the last Passover, you will be very interesting to know. You know, Jesus said, "Look for the man with the, the picture on his head and follow him." You could ask the same question: Why didn't Jesus just tell you, go to this street, this this number, this house? That's it. Why did Jesus have to say all these things? Because there is a build up, right? There is a build up towards the climax, right? Jesus didn't want Judas to know about it. So there's a build up to the climax uh, when, when, Je when Judas finally betrayed Jesus. So, so that's, well, to answer that, that question, it could have been any other thing. I mean, sure. Judas could just point Slept to Jesus. Jesus yeah, you know, yeah. you know, <laughs> that would, no, but yeah. I, I, I take the point on the contrast because uh, it's, it's such an intimate thing, right? Yes, and yes. yet it was used by yes. Judas to yes. betray Jesus. And, and that perhaps also spoke to Jesus' emotion at that point. I mean, it was a very intimate act, yeah. yet it was used, f used to betray him. And, and that would have, it's like, you know, plunging in a knife and then twisting yeah. it around just yeah. to, you know, make it yeah. uh, more painful for, yeah. for Jesus himself to, to yeah. experience that. Fully agree with that. No, yeah. thank you for that. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in, maybe because of your PhD. Uh, <laughs> but Peter was given a second chance by Jesus himself. How will we be given a second chance? Oh. And by whom? I think we are given many chances. I always say, as a believer in Christ, as a fellow Christian, fellow brother in Christ, I would have died long ago mm. apart from the grace of God because I'm a sinner saved by grace. Mm. Although the Lord has been good to me, the Lord has blessed me. If I could testify before you, my spiritual intimacy with God has grown. 5th March this year, in my church service, when my PIC was preaching on Romans 6, you know, dead to sin, the life in Christ, as I was worshipping God, singing the final hymn, I felt the intimacy with God mm -hmm. and I teared. I I'm not one who tear. I I'm the one here doing the Bible study, <laughs> you know, preparing sermon. But I teared because I sense God's presence. Mm -hmm. And I desire to be filled with the Spirit. 21st April, all right, in my own bedroom, I prayed, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Nothing happened. <laughs> There's no, yeah. you know, praying in tongues. There's no <laughs> the closest I came to that experience was when I was a young believer, very young believer, in my own devotional time, I prayed and I almost prayed in tongues, but I, I got shocked, I was frightened. And ever since, a few over years later, nothing happened. 21st April, I decided, I prayed, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Nothing happened. Before church camp in June, I realized something happened. I realized even though the temptations were there, the propensity to sin disappeared. Wow. I think John Wesley would yeah. call it the way of perfection. You yeah. know? So, so I realized God had answered my prayer. 26 August in my church as we were learning more about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, we had Pastor Jonathan Seed, our district superintendent, came to conduct a seminar for us. My wife came along and I was very thankful my wife was there because she also wanted to learn more about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And then when Pastor Jonathan gave the invitation to come forward, I actually didn't intend to go forward. 
but my wife went forward. So I thought I better go forward to support her. <laughs> okay. And as I went forward, I received the gift of praying in tongues. Wow. But at the same breath, I would say that I'm a sinner saved by grace. Wow. And the Lord has given me many, many chances. So chances come from God. Thank you. From people, yeah. sometimes they won't. <laughs> okay. yeah. But that's okay. You know, if I can maybe sure. just elaborate a little. In my family, when we have sinned against each other, a terrible thing, I teach my family, myself included, don't say sorry. It's so easy to say sorry. You know, mm. I'm sorry. And you, he you hear of the, st the story of the schoolboy who said sorry to the teacher, you know, but she's standing up in his heart, you know. <laughs> so don't say sorry. What do we say then? I learn. It's biblical. I learn, say, I've sinned against God and you in this and name the sin. Wow. Will you forgive me? That's very intense though. Yeah, I mean, very uh, intense. Yeah. <laughs> Some people will not forgive you because their hurt is so deep. Yeah. Then you say, well, it means a lot to me to know that you have forgiven me. When you are ready, let me know. And I'll ask the same question again. Will you forgive me? I pray so I'll, people may yeah. not give us second chances, but with God, He's, he's so loving. You know, that, that's... No, thank you. I pray that I'll never offend you because... Uh, <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> it works both ways. <laughs> I may offend you too. <laughs> but thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ho, for spending this morning with us. And uh, why don't we put our hands together and just uh, thank, thank Dr. Ho Bun Chong for being with us this, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, a, a really kind of a good uh, ending for us as we look at uh, Peter, uh, you know, coming before the Lord, even though he was so close to him, he failed. Uh, at that very critical moment. And I think for many of us, perhaps we too may experience something similar in our lives. Perhaps at work, in our families, or even right at the car park before you were coming in. But whatever it is, let us come to God in faith and ask Him to redeem us, to forgive us, and restore us into relationship with Him. Will you now receive God's words of blessing? People of God, as you go forth from here into the week ahead, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord pour forth his favor upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And together all of God's people say, Amen. Please take your seats.